Good evening. Welcome to Progressive Soup. My name is David Stevenson. I'll be tonight's host. With me, I have Gary Goncavis, candidate for mayor of Danbury. Gary is going to talk about his campaign, talk about his vision for the city, and other subjects which we'll get into. First of all, Gary, tell our audience a little bit about your background. What, what, how does your bio read? Who are you and where are you from? Where are you now? Sure, David. Um, well, I was born and raised in Danbury and educated in our fine public school system. And um, I have a degree, a business degree from um, Naugatuck Valley Community College. I have a degree from the University of Bridgeport. So I stayed close to home. Uh, and I have been a, um, a member of the great general reinsurance company of Stamford. Right now I am uh, vice president of global finance. And I've been there almost 30 years and uh, it is a Berkshire Hathaway company and a Warren Buffett owned company so uh, we uh, have a, a tremendous uh, team there and it's a pleasure to have been working there so long. So with a background in economics I would imagine you probably would have a lot of good input in these tough times economically that Danbury and the rest of America is going through. Um, well, you know, um, the good thing is growing up with this corporate discipline for so long, I mean, it does uh, cause you to, to think in a certain way. Uh, I am a very fiscal conservative, so I'm a very conservative Democrat, and uh, frankly, it's, it's uh, you know, we'll get to this later, I'm sure, but it's one of the reasons that I'm running for mayor. Uh, I just don't understand the financial policies that, that have been played out here in the last eight years, and I believe that uh, we can do things better, and I'm looking forward to the opportunity. Let's get right to the issues. Sure. May I start with education? Yes, you may. Tell us about the school system in Danbury. You mentioned it. it's a good school system. You've, it's, you've been through it. Mm -hmm. You see its evolution over the last uh, few decades. Where do you see it now and where do you see it going? Well, I, I'm very concerned about education in Danbury and I'm concerned from a, a few different angles. Uh, as a uh, corporate executive for General Re, I've had the opportunity to travel around the world and I know and I've seen firsthand in countries like India and Poland and others that you know their children today are competing for jobs in this country with our children and trust me those children from other countries are very bright, they're very well educated and they're very hungry. So. Uh, I am pro-education. I feel that it, it is uh, imperative to keep um, educators in our classrooms. And it's one of the uh, bones of contention I have with this administration. Uh, it's probably the first budget in history mm -hmm. uh, where the um, school board budget was not increased with local tax dollars. And again, another manifestation of this administration is that this is, uh, we just had an early retirement package uh, offered to uh, uh, you know the teachers uh, in Danbury and and really the whole face of the Danbury school system has been changed because so many long tenured and very very good educators uh, had decided to take that package and and, uh, and leave and it, it's really a shame I think there are a lot of great young teachers coming up through the ranks but I know from the corporate world in my experience that you cannot replace that um, experience overnight it's going to take years to, to get back to where we were. And again, our, our uh, you know, Connecticut Mastery uh, scores did increase a little bit this year, mm -hmm. but again, you know, with that, uh, um, you know, with the leaving of all those teachers, I mean, I just can't believe that it's going to help that situation. Early retirement always seems to me, at face value, to be something that uh, you save, you save some money in the short term. But I think, I think you touched on this, um, in the long term, you lose a lot, and you're granted, granted you have the, the new teachers coming in and they bring a, a fresh approach to certain things, but isn't there a lot more value in having seasoned teachers or a better oh. mix of seasoned teachers? Oh, absolutely. I think the more seasoning the teachers have, I think the more they have to offer. Certainly the older you are, and, and you know that, you and I are probably very close to the same age. I mean, that, that worldly experience, I think, uh, is, is something that is needed in the classroom. And I think, you know, um, it's something that the children need today. And again, I, I'm, I'm very pro, uh, you know, educator staying in, a, in the classroom. Certainly older teachers, as, as I've seen, 
um, when my kids were going through school, the older teachers had a better sense of how to discipline, not how to be tough, right. but they knew how to approach the children in a way that the children very quickly understood that they were not there for anything other than for educational purposes. It's an excellent point. I remember I had a teacher once, and this is, I was a freshman in high school, and um, the first day of class, she scared me so much, I went right to my guidance counselor, and I said, you gotta get me out of this class. I, 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 I'm not gonna survive. Uh -huh. And he said, no, no. He said, just give it a few more days. And honest to God, by the end of the semester, she and I were like great friends. And uh, you know, it, it just goes to show you, I mean, it's another bit of experience that has come to roost. And know. again, the life experiences of, of, of seasoned teachers have so much more to offer. No, no disrespect to younger teachers. No, not at all. But, but they're, they're not there yet. Right. They're not in that position yet of, the, of a seasoned teacher to, to, to have seen enough children to know how to react to individual sure. children and, and play to the strengths of individual children and motivate them. Absolutely. And the other one, one other quick point, I mean, even the, the, the newer teachers, I mean, I'm just afraid of, of the budget situation here in Danbury where we may be looking to, um, you know, let go some of these uh, newer teachers as well because we're just not going to have the money. I mean, the, the financial doors and, 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 and the, uh, the walls are closing in here and, um, you know, I know we'll talk about it and I'm interested in, in, in speaking speaking about it when you're ready. How does this all turn out and uh, how this all play out in terms of taxes? The taxes is a big issue nowadays. Um, how does this fit well, into the whole the whole design of taxes in, in the city of Danbury? Well, I mean, one of the things I've, I'm concerned about, and, and one of the things that, that's caused me to run for mayor is that I've seen eight straight years of tax increases. I've seen, uh, you know, this administration uh, with its big ticket penchant for spending, uh, spend an enormous amount of money in long-term debt. And with that, we taxpayers have gotten reduced city services in the form of, you know, our city hall is closed on Fridays. And, and you're not going to sit here and tell me that it's eliminating 20% of those expenses because people are working later on the other days and salary is a big piece of this. Um, to me, it's unconscionable that our city hall is not open five days a week. The other thing is reduced library hours and it's not only the fact that it affects our children and it affects young mothers uh, who bring their children there and then have them exposed to different media but also there's you know we're in a, in a tough economic time and there's so many people out of work and, and a lot of them don't have computers and they go to the library uh, and be, have become dependent on those uh, you know facilities being there so I mean that's a you know reduced library hours is another bone of contention for me and, and the other thing is and, and to me it just seems very easy but th these are the worst road conditions I've seen in my my tenure in this city and again it's I'll state my age is 56 years old mm -hmm. and I've never seen the roads this bad and of course you know it's election year and it's it's September of election year so now we're seeing some road paving going on but um, the roads are still in horrendous shape and so I, I question where all this money is going it's not going to the schools uh, it's not going to keep our city services up it's not going to keep our infrastructure up from what I can see I mean the everyday infrastructure that we all use, where is this money going to? I mean, I've seen the budget lines, um, but you know what? We need more efficiency in City Hall, uh, and, we, and we need a government that is more accountable to the people. And, um, you know, the slogan, people over politics, uh, I'm sorry, I just, uh, I don't believe it. I've seen occasions where it just cannot be true, mm -hmm. and uh, be, be happy to cite a few things for you if you'd like. Absolutely, love to hear. But before we go on to that, mm -hmm. um, I just want to put a put a word in for the libraries because the library sure. has really become a great gathering place again, mm -hmm. and it seems an sure. odd time to be cutting back on library services when we've had a few decades now where people kind of strayed away from the library a little yeah. bit. Yeah. Now, as you say, with um, with uh, the the need for the internet connection, mm -hmm. with um, with people not being able to afford to go to the movies as often as they used to or right. go out to other forms of entertainment, the library has really become a marvelous gathering place again. Absolutely. And it needs to, I would think, needs to be open more hours, not fewer hours. Now, you want to decide a few of those uh, specifics about... Yeah, I, I think, you know, um, one thing is... <laughs> 
we talk about we talk about uh, people over politics, mm -hmm. and that's been the slogan now for eight years. And, and, and frankly, eight years ago, I believed it. I, I voted for for Mark. And uh, um, but you know, as the years have gone on, and I've sat back and observed what's been happening here, I just have to question it. I mean, you know, one classic example is that he, you know, Mark has has hurt our. Uh, economic uh, status in this city by taking a full-time economic director's position, turning that into a 15-hour-a-week political bone to uh, a state senator who was his ex-chief of staff. Yeah. I mean, which is ridiculous. Talk about people over politics. I mean, that's unbelievable to me. And the other thing is now that's that position has turned into a coordinator's position. And, and one of the first things I would do, David, would be to appoint a full-time economic development director because I feel, you know, having been in the corporate world, we have to go out there as a city mm -hmm. and aggressively attract you know, good corporate, um, you know, jobs back into uh, Danbury and, you know, offer our community more uh, jobs and actually better quality jobs. Uh, and that, that's one example. The other example is, and there's, there's many of these examples, as far as the city charter goes, I mean, the city charter mm -hmm. is the constitution of Danbury. Yes. Um, and again, there are specific intents in that charter. And one of the um, charter uh, areas that I believe the mayor has breached, and, and and breached right in the public's face is the fact that you know since 1991 when the charter was last revised mm -hmm. there it states that the most you could bond in a single year is five hundred thousand dollars without going to um, the voters and last year he was able somehow and I will use the word coerce I don't know how he did it but the same bonding attorney mm -hmm. who had held steadfast from 1991 to say that you know, 500 was the most you could bond in any single year without going to the voters. That same bonding attorney rendered a decision that the mayor could float multiple $500,000 uh, bonds, and last year he floated five. So he spent $2.5 million, did not ask a soul in this city to vote on it, uh, just uh, got them passed through the council, which is primarily Republican-based, uh, you know, 14 to 7 on the Republican side, and, um, you know, again, to me, as a taxpayer, I considered it a uh, slap in the face. That's an important point to, to, re to remember because, as you say, two and a half million dollars in bonding is an awful lot of bonding and an awful lot of um, money to put on the shoulders of future taxpayers in Danbury. Question. And, and to take that and divide it up into five separate separate half million dollar pieces rather than being honest and saying we're bonding two and a half million dollars and let the voters decide sure. you end up with um, you end up with uh, yeah. uh, the, the five pieces of a pie that add up to a, a very large it's pie. significant number following years of other significant numbers and again without the uh, the people uh, as in the people over politics not mm -hmm. being involved so it seems like that um, that it maybe should have gone out to referendum absolutely yeah yeah, without a doubt. We're going to break now, I believe, for a public service announcement. We'll be back in, in a minute. This is Progressive Soup. I'm David Stevenson, and I have uh, Gary Goncalves with me. Thanks very much. See you in a minute. One more correct answer, and you're the big winner in the Social Security quiz. And here we go. What will the Social Security statement tell you about your retirement? A the date you should retire, B, how much you can expect your Social Security benefits to be, or C, what you will owe in taxes. I know this. I remember getting my Social Security statement in the mail, and I know it's B. Are you absolutely sure? Yes, that's my final answer. Well, you're right. Congratulations. Retirement planning is not a game. Watch your mail for your Social Security statement and use it to plan your financial future. Remember, Social Security should only be part, not all, of your retirement income. The future is in your hands. Welcome back to Progressive Soup. I'm David Stevenson. I have Gary Goncalves with me tonight. We're, while we were off camera, we were discussing um, the issue of um, tax tax breaks for corporations. 
and specifically one that involved BRT. Um, a seven-year break. Could you explain that to uh, to our audience and tell us about what they sure. did and what you would would have done differently? Well, I, I think the first thing is the mayor set a precedent by offering tax breaks to residential developers, and in this there's two particular instances. One on Crosby Street, and, and again it involves the same developer, BRT. Um, on Crosby Street, they were given a seven-year tax break um, under the guise of providing, um, you know, uh, um, affordable income. Uh, affordable income housing mm -hmm. uh, to people and and what's happened there is it's turned turned into an unsanctioned dorm for Westcon uh, which was not its intention um, secondly uh, w you know they, they took down the old Amphenol property and they uh, where our mall used to be the original Danbury mall used to be in downtown Danbury but um, uh, again BRT bought that property and, and again seven-year tax breaks as soon as something uh, is built and and unfortunately the only thing that's been being uh, uh, built there is weeds. Um, I mean, and it's cordoned off with a fence because there is, uh, uh, you know, material uh, contamination in there. And um, it's just a, uh, uh, actually, the, the News Times actually ran a story. It's one of the biggest eyesores in the city. Yeah. Who's responsible for the contamination and who's going to address the cleanup? Uh, well, BRT is responsible, I believe, for um, cleaning up that site and, and preparing it for hopefully eventual construction but as far as I'm concerned uh, based on the agreements that were in place uh, you know BRT should have started cleaning that up a lot sooner and and started to build things there you know for young professionals now you mentioned the um, the what was meant to be affordable housing for and affordable housing I'm a realtor and I understand affordable housing a lot of people don't understand affordable housing affordable housing is not for non-working people affordable housing is housing that working middle class right. citizens of the area can afford to buy and own in a, in a difficult place to live like Fairfield County is a difficult place to buy a home. Affordable housing only allows regular working families with incomes up to on generally around the sixty seventy thousand dollar threshold mm -hmm. to be able to buy a place of their own to live. So this is what we're talking about, working class folks. And instead, we know it turned into a, essentially a college dorm um, without any discussion. Right. And that's, exactly something right. That's, that's something that really was not what the plan envisioned, but it quickly evolved into. Well, and then you, you add in the tax breaks uh, for this residential developer coupled with the eight years, uh, eight straight years of tax increases mm -hmm. for the rest of us, uh, you know, taxpayers, and it's just, uh, it's just blatantly not fair. Tax breaks for corporations is something which, which strikes me as being inherently, inherently unfair, and we have a situation now going on where the governor of the state of Connecticut is looking to, um, to give one of our companies two and a half million dollars to, to stay here for a couple, three extra years. And if you divide the amount by the number of jobs it saves, it ends, it ends up being about $100,000 per employee that the state of Connecticut will use our tax dollars for to oh. keep those jobs here in the short term. Well, it's, it's that kind of uh, mentality that's led us to a, an $8.5 billion deficit in the state of Connecticut, and uh, to me, that's, uh, that's unconscionable as well. Tell us more. Tell, tell our audience more about your vision for the future of Danbury. Well, uh, you know, you, you touched on and the first thing is, uh, again, I'm very pro-education. I believe we have to uh, find ways to keep educators in the classroom and increase that school board budget uh, as needed. And we've got to find, you know, I, I would like to work with the school board and uh, the teachers to find, uh, you know, more uh, creative ways perhaps using uh, more use of technology, maybe some remote teaching um, as well. Um, if we can to to again give our, our, our kids the, the best education and the broadest based education that we can it's not only about you know uh, you know arithmetic and, and English and things like that it, it's it's you know life experience skills too um, the next thing really is taxes and bonding I mean the previous uh, Democratic administration under Mayor Eriquez I mean hadn't raised taxes in 12 years so there is there are there are precedents set uh, in that arena, and there, 
there, there are ways to do it, and I, I think with my corporate experience, I mean, I, I have been for the last five or ten years really a change agent at uh, General Reinsurance, and my job was to, you know, find efficiencies in processes, and I know how to um, model processes and, and look for, uh, you know, uh, pain points and, and, and handoff points and, and, and manual uh, um, entry of things where which can be automated and I think there is efficiency that we could uh, find in, in city government within each of the departments I know for instance uh, the police I think they, it was even in the paper a few months back that they uh, they actually uh, calculate their overtime hours uh, on paper still I mean it just shouldn't happen I mean it's uh, you know it's it, it could be wrought with human error and again it can be automated and and we can uh, have police uh, more police perhaps uh, back on the streets but um, so taxes and bonding and again I'm a fiscal conservative I think at this point we've run up uh, a, a significant amount of long-term debt uh, and again it's it, what happens is in the budget for this current year we're paying almost 14 million dollars uh, for long-term debt and I don't believe that includes uh, the police station that hasn't hit us yet and uh, again you know, talk about fi fiscal restraint. I look at that police station again. God bless the policemen of Danbury. Um, they have lived in cramped quarters for so long. And they've been so very patient, and they're a fine police force. And I believe they they deserve the new police station. But uh, you know, rather than spend the money that was spent on that police station, you know, spend ten million dollars left. Give them a very great state of the art facility. But let's take that other ten million and let's keep teachers in the classroom and and let's not for early retirements and and you know uh, change the whole facade of our of our school system um, so again I, I question uh, the fiscal uh, responsibility of this administration I've called the tax and spend and until somebody proves me wrong um, that's what I'm I'm saying it is and you know the third big thing for me is really quality of life um, you know, at one time, uh, again, during the Iroquois administration, we were the number one uh, city in the in the country, and we've uh, dropped far from that at this point. And again, I think that you know the downtown needs to be uh, paid attention to and this administration has not paid attention to it in the least and in fact since I've come on board in March and announced and started talking about downtown redevelopment all of a sudden the mayor is convening you know developers in his uh, in his uh, boardroom and talking about what they can do to uh, enhance the downtown I think you know Danbury has the assets to be a leader in the cultural arts in Western Connecticut I think you know Danbury certainly has the best diversified set of restaurants, I think, uh, in the area. Amen and I mean, that. you can have Indian food one night, Peruvian food another night, Brazilian food, Portuguese food, Italian food, I mean, and then you can go to Chuck's for a nice steak dinner if you mm -hmm. want. So we, we've got it all, and I think, you know, the, again, I say the downtown has been neglected. If you go down there, it's dirty. Uh, the, tree, the, the trees need to be pruned. I mean, it's, it's to that elementary a level. So um, I think more attention has to be uh, pay down there as well as I think we need to work very closely with uh, Joe De Silva. He owns the Palace Theater. I think the Palace Theater is not the, the whole solution down there. I think it's just a part of the solution but I believe other cities who have Palace Theaters that have been refurbished have done very very well. Um, and again, you know, talk about quality of life, traffic. <laughs> Don't try to get from Bethel to New Fairfield at 5 o'clock in the afternoon because yeah. you're not going to get there in any timely fashion and you know I, I've talked about a new traffic improvement plan I think we need to convene a study to look at the the traffic patterns and the way our main arteries are flowing today which are not flowing very effectively um, I think you know uh, we've got to look at making uh, some streets one way perhaps and, and you know bring traffic out and bring traffic in but I would be a big proponent of four lane corridors through the city north to south and east to west and again you look at you know the Seeger Street to Driftway Point Road. Mm -hmm. That should have been four lanes for a long time. I mean, that uh, money was uh, um, approved, um, but it was never really funded. And again, I, I look to this administration. Here we've had a Republican administration in Danbury with a Republican administration in Hartford. And that that four lanes, uh, still we haven't seen the money for that. And, and I, I just don't understand why more pressure was not put on uh, the state government to get us those uh, four lanes. Um, I, I think we have entirely too many signs 
lines in Danbury and entirely too many traffic lights. Um, you know, it seems like y you step on the gas to, to go and next thing you know, uh, 100 feet down the street, you're stopping again, either for a light or a stop sign. And I just think we've, we've got to make it more conducive for people to visit here, for people to visit our downtown, for people to come to Danbury and spend some time and not feel like they're, uh, you know, mice in a, in a maze trying to escape. I can sense that you have thought a lot about traffic, and traffic has been a big issue in Danbury, a big unaddressed issue in Danbury right. for decades, literally right. decades, right. and it's only gotten more difficult, and, and something is going to have to happen in the near future to get it, to get it to where we're, we're, we're building bridges to the 21st century, the 22nd century, rather than to the 18th century. No, I, I, I wholeheartedly uh, agree with you, David. You also talked briefly about um, Well, we talked about taxes. Sure. Sure. And education, and, education uh, yeah. and we've talked about uh, you know uh, transportation. transportation. We've we talked about the, you know the quality of life in Danbury. And I think the other thing too is again, just the uh, I think it's very important now that you know D Danbury has always been a very diverse community. You know diversity is the fabric of our community. It's the fabric of our country. And uh, you know unfortunately uh, now I think the city has been polarized uh, by you know the uh, the immigration uh, you know uh, debates and I think there's there's a lot of sentiment on both sides there and in my most stringent objection to that whole situation, that polarization, is that I believe that uh, you know the mayor, um, you know, uh, did it for his own personal gain. And you know, uh, under this administration, I mean, the first thing he talked about was organized crime. Uh, you know, uh, the, the the Indian casinos coming here. Um, you know, the immigrants coming here. I mean, it's it's one fear factor issue after another. I get a sense that that the police detectives, particularly the detectives in Danbury, are not real happy about ICE for one very important reason. And that's because they used to be able to get a lot of good information from, from folks who would certainly tell on anybody that was breaking the law. And now some of, them, some of the folks that are, that are out there are afraid to speak to the police. Right simply because they're worried about being rounded up and put in a detention facility. Sure. We're going to have to leave it at that now. We'll come back and have Gary back on before the end of the sh before the election and talk about this and many m other issues. I'm David Stevenson. This is Progressive Soup. I've had the pleasure of having Gary Concalves as my guest tonight. Thanks very much. Enjoy your evening.